fact that you've also got a worshiping spirit about you and you give me a great opportunity to worship each week. Thank you. John's Gospel, chapter number 14. Continuing our study this week on the Upper Room Discourse. This week has, um, this week's passage, I've had a couple weeks now. And so you give me two weeks and I can turn a few verses into a few months worth of preaching. So I, I, um, I have tried to discipline myself uh, to distill this message, not just because I've had a couple of weeks on it, but because this is one of those dense passages you know, that, that has so much truth in it that could be expounded. And um, so I, I, I ask that uh, the Lord would give you great attention this morning, but also give me uh, an anointing to deliver a good word for you. John's Gospel, chapter number 14, we're going to begin reading in verse 12 here in just a moment. I want to recap for you the Upper Room Discourse is where Jesus is taking advantage of the last opportunity that he's going to have to, to speak, to teach his disciples before the cross. He's trying to comfort them as he instructs them. Uh, however, the disciples are horribly upset because they understand that something is about to happen, that, that Jesus is going to go somewhere that they can't follow him, and they're going to be without him. And they're sensing this loss. And so, especially in chapter 14, I think the entirety of the chapter uh, is the cure for a troubled heart. He starts off the chapter by saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. And we've already looked at a couple of the things that, that he, he has said. Don't let your hearts be troubled because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going somewhere that you can't follow me right now, but I'm preparing a place for you. And there will be a forever place with you with my Father in heaven. He's also saying, don't let your hearts be troubled because I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you already know me. You don't have to go looking for another way. You don't have to spend your life searching for the real truth. You don't have to go searching to experience the fullness of life. You already have it because you know me. And this week, he's saying, don't let your hearts be troubled because it's going to be better for you once I go because you're going to do the things that I did and greater things than I have done. And he's going to explain how that's possible. John's Gospel, chapter number 14, beginning in verse 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let's pray together. Lord, even as I read these again this morning, I don't know how many times I've read these in the previous weeks, there is powerful truth in here. And I pray that today you would anoint our hearing, that uh, we would hear from the Spirit of God during this time, and you would anoint the preaching so that I might glorify you by what I say, that all things might be done for the praise of your name. May it be so in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, I want us to just stop for a minute up front and, and soak in what Jesus just said. He said that, that he's looking at these disciples and he's telling them that they, and I think by extension us, will, will do the works that he did and even greater. At some level, you've got to feel that, right? How? And that he will do for us whatever we ask for in his name. Okay, those are just huge things, right? 
And I know that they're just in the midst of this passage and you can read a chapter of scripture and come across so much truth and walk away unaffected by it almost because you, you, you just glance at it and don't give it a second thought. But I want you to ponder on this for a minute. That Jesus, who fed multitudes with a sack lunch, Jesus, who healed people of many and various diseases, even lifelong ones like blindness, deafness, people who were lame, lepers, people who were paralyzed entirely. He brought people back from the dead even when they had been four days dead. That's really dead, y'all. He knew things about individuals and about situations that were seemingly unknowable. It's like he could read minds. He came into situations and he cast out demons. He acknowledged there was a spiritual power at work, an evil spiritual power, and he shooed it like shooing a cat. He's like, get out of here. And they, they, they took off. He could command the wind and the elements. He spoke to storms and they stopped. And that's not to mention just the the, the seeming time after time where he comes into places and he brings consolation to people, where he encouraged people, where he gave instruction that multitudes might understand. And, 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 and you hear that kind of stuff, and I'm just scratching the surface. In fact, the Gospels just scratched the surface of all that he did because one of the writers said if we recorded everything that Jesus did, the earth wouldn't be able to, be, well, earth wouldn't be able to hold all of the of the, the writing. And, and so, so he, he's saying, in light of all that Jesus has done, he looks at these guys and says, you're going to do what I did, and you're going to do even greater things than I did. That's a spectacular promise, y'all. And it's easy to gloss it over. But if you're like me, and you want to see the supernatural happen, you want to see the power of God put on display. You can read a verse like th verses like these and feel like that you're being invited to six flags over Jesus. <laughs> hey, come in here, we're going we're gonna to do the stuff and there's going to be power manifestations. You read verses like this and it's like, let's just stop right now and develop prayer lines and start doing this. You know, let's just, you know, I want to see this kind of stuff. He just said that we would see that kind of stuff and greater things, right? Well, I want you to know up front, as I'm going to unpack this passage, that I believe this passage is an invitation for each of us to live a more supernatural life than we're probably experiencing right now. I'm putting that word probably in there because I'm not going to assume that all of you aren't living this to the fullest. I think some of you are experiencing a really full life as a greater works life as Jesus described. But for the most part, I think that many people are probably not experiencing it to the fullness that they could. And this passage is an invitation to do so. But I want you to, I can't gloss over the reality that this verse and these verses are very particular. And I'm going to unpack that just a bit. They're not wide open. It's not carte blanche. There's something very particular about these verses. So we're going to unpack them by looking at a few very important words. And the first is this, that the promise is given for whoever believes. Jesus announces it, that, that whoever believes on him would do the things that he did. Now, this gets misinterpreted, I think, a lot of times as a description of believing in Christ as some top, top rung of a Christian caste system that's limited for only those who believe in him the most or who have some kind of special faith that's been dispensed to them or the special few who somehow are able to believe enough but that is not how John uses these words. In every instance throughout the Gospel of John, 
when it talks about believing on him and those who believe on him, it is describing in total everyone who is saved. It's referring to all believers. And so here, when he makes this statement, whosoever believes, it's not saying that, that it's just you guys, you few that are in this upper room with me. He, he's not saying it's just you few. It's not saying it's just those who are most likely to follow me out of the crowds. It's, it's like he, he's saying, listen, for you and for others who aren't in this room and for others who are going to come through untold generations, whosoever believes in me is a candidate to do the works that I did and even greater. It's not limited to the select of the elect. It's open to every last one of us who are in Christ. Now, it is particular to those who are in Christ, who have been saved, who believe in him. But when John uses terminology like this, he uses it to describe the entirety of the body of Christ. So everyone, and I mean everyone who is in Christ, is a candidate to do greater works, to do the works that he did and even greater. So you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to teach a class. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be on TV. You don't have any kind of special degree. You don't have to be an apostle for that matter. All you need is to be a believer in Christ and all that he's done for you and be saved by his grace. So the first promise that we need to see in this is that it's for whoever believes. The second thing I want to point out is that the works that Jesus did were more than just miracles. This word works, what is it describing? I think it's describing more than just miracles, but please hear me. It's definitely not describing less than miracles. It's describing more than just miracles, but it's not describing less. I've already said that Jesus in his ministry went from place to place, bringing consolation to hurting people. That's one of his works. He preached the gospel to the poor. It was one of his works. He taught scriptures to the masses, and there was revelation that took place through the Spirit. That was one of his works. But in addition to those things, he also raised Lazarus from the dead after four days. That was one of his works. So these works that Jesus is describing here, when he talks about the works that Jesus did, they are inclusive of miracles and everything else that he did as he ministered throughout those three and a half years that he was working with the disciples. So there are those, and the reason I say that is this, there are those that talk about the works of Jesus as, you know, well, he taught people, he ministered to the poor, you know, he showed compassion. Listen, those are the works of Christ. There is no question. But you cannot say that those are the only works of Christ. He also did miracles. I think it's like 25 times this word works is used in the Gospels of John. And 16 of those times it's used to describe miracles. So, I'm open to the belief that, to the understanding that it's just this, the works of Christ include more than just miracles. But they certainly don't mean less than miracles. It's the whole gamut of what Jesus did in his ministry while he was here on this earth. So that means that the works of Jesus can be offering a cup of cold water in his name. Hallelujah, we've dug a well in Africa. That's a work of Jesus. Wade's going to share more about that next week, I believe. But, but the works of Jesus are also inclusive of those supernatural things. Someone came to me this morning and testified that last week they came up and received prayer and God miraculously healed a torn rotator cuff and they haven't had any pain in it since last week. Okay, all of it, hear me friends, all of it, now here's what, <laughs> 
See, this is the kind of stuff right here that causes me to not be able to, to stay in a time limit. But I, I feel like I can't let it pass. There are those who let their experience dictate what this means. And they will say things like, well, my life, I haven't seen a lot of supernatural, miracle-type stuff, and so for me, or I believe, or I think what the Word is actually saying here is just kind of, you know, social justice kind of stuff over here. And so let's do stuff. Let's minister to the poor. Let's feed the hungry. Let's do those things. And those are the works of Jesus. And then there are people on the other side of the spectrum that said, no, 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 the works of Jesus are entire. That's the miraculous. If you're not doing the miracle, if it's the miracles, if you're not doing the miracles, that's not the works of Jesus. So if the dead aren't being raised, we're not doing the greater works. If the sick aren't being healed, we're not doing the greater works. If, 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 if the miraculous isn't taking place, if the blind aren't seeing, if the deaf aren't hearing, we're not doing the greater works. And what I want to tell you is I think it encompasses the whole gamut. People get out of balance when they say, no, it's just over here, no, it's just over here. I think that we need to be living saying that we're going to go into all the earth and we're going to be God's ambassadors, Jesus' ambassadors wherever we go. And there are going to be times when we offer a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, but there are also going to be times when we say, take up your bed and walk. It's the whole thing. So it's more than just miracles, but it's definitely not less. Third thing I want you to notice from really verse 12 is that I want us to talk about what Jesus meant by our works being greater works. That's kind of a difficult thing to unpack, isn't it? How are we going to do greater things than Jesus did? Because he did some pretty amazing things. The word greater there, one you're very familiar with, you, might, you just may not know it. That word comes from, is, is the, its root word is mega, which we use all the time. But mega is a fairly generic word. It could mean size, it could mean importance, it could mean degree. It could mean greater in a whole lot of different ways. This has led to there being a fair amount of speculation about what he meant by saying that we would do greater works. I will tell you up front that I don't think that he's saying that our works will be greater in grandeur because I really don't know how you judge a miracle's value or a compassionate act's impact. I, I don't know how you judge things like that because in my mind, raising Lazarus from the dead was no harder nor any more spectacular than feeding 5,000 people with loaves and fishes. Both of them were miraculous and demanded, required the supernatural intervening power of God. And, and so how do you say one is more impressive than another? I don't have a clue. And likewise, I don't know if it's more impressive that Jesus let a prostitute anoint his feet or if he sat down and ate supper with tax collectors and shared the gospel with the poor, which is a more compassionate act. I don't have a clue. I don't know how you judge things like that. So I don't think when he talks about them being greater that it's a description of somehow they're, they're greater in grandeur. I think the context here would lead us to believe that the works are greater in a couple of senses. That they're greater because he said he was going to the Father and what we're going to find out that that really means in the in just the next few verses, is that he's going to the Father, but when he goes to the Father, he's, the reason that that's better and the reason that's going to allow us to do greater works is because when he goes to the Father, he's sending back the Holy Spirit in his place. And the Spirit is not just going to be with us like Jesus was with the disciples, but rather the Spirit is going to be in us, which means that he, that, that he will be in us all the time individually, wherever each of us go. That means that since Jesus was in his ministry on the earth, he was at one place at one time, limited to that one body, wherever he went, ministry took place, and people followed him as a consequence. But when he goes to the Father, he's going to send the Holy Spirit back, and the Holy Spirit is not just going to be with these men, he's going to inhabit each of these men individually so that when they go out, whichever direction that they might go, they're actually going to be taking the other Jesus without a body, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy 
Spirit with them, and they're going to be extensions of Jesus in every direction that they go out in the earth. So that means that rather having one man operating in one place at one time, what you have is every believer being filled with the Spirit of God, going forth with the power that Jesus had while he was alive, doing the works of Christ in greater magnitude, in greater multitude than ever took place while he was ministering here on the earth. And friends, hear me, that has totally happened. It happened from the upper room when the Spirit of God came and Peter went out, he preached one message, 3,000 people got saved, filled with the Spirit, and then the gospel began to go out to the entire earth and it is still going out to the ends of the earth to this day. Thank God it reached back into the hills of East Tennessee where it got me. I don't know where it had to go to reach you, but it has gone forth and gone out. And you say, but has it gone forth with the kind of miraculous power though? Sure it does. The word is still being confirmed with signs and wonders today. And we may not see it a whole lot here. And I've got my reasons for why we don't see it as much in the States as it exists in other places. Uh, but but there are, there are signs and wonders accompanying the gospel all over the planet right now. And regardless of whether or not we see something happening every day along the way that we would deem to be miraculous, I think a lot of things are miraculous that we look at and explain away. However, that Eastern mindset has a hard time with the supernatural. But... But there are signs and wonders accompanying the gospel all over the planet today. And in a real sense, I mean, really, this has come to pass, that the body of Christ is right now doing the greater works. We are going to the ends of the earth, to the ends of time. 2,000 years of spirit-filled believers are still assaulting the unreached corners of this planet until everyone and every ethnic group has disciples made within it. We, the church, have done these greater things. But I pray that you can hear me. There are greater things still yet to come for the church in general and for us as individuals. So what does this promise mean for you? Should you as a believer be expecting to do the things that Jesus did and even greater? Well, the short answer, and I believe the obvious answer is this. Yes. Should you be expecting to do these things? Yes. You should have some level of expectation based on this scripture that you would do these things. The stuff that Jesus did, the stuff that he did even greater when all of us do it together because you're an ambassador of Christ. You're commissioned with taking Jesus into every sphere of influence that you go. You do so by the Spirit of God that's resonant within you. You're an agent of Christ who does his works in this world, whether it be offering a cup of cold water in his name or praying for the sick, doing miracles. This passage is an invitation to live a more supernatural life than you probably are already experiencing right now. It is. And I say probably because I don't want to assume that some of, I believe some of you are are already living a greater works lifestyle, but there are those of us that aren't. And this is an invitation for you to do so. However, what you're not being is released into a supernatural theme park. That's not what's happening. You're not being released into a place that caters to your wants and desires and whims. This is not a promise that you're going to get omnipotence on demand and that it's somehow being granted to you through proxy. You're not being empowered to do whatever you want as long as you put the tagline of in Jesus' name at the end of it. 
This is an invitation to be a conduit for divine power that serves the will, the ends, and the purposes of God. The greater works has a goal. All the greater work, the works that Jesus did in the greater works, they have a goal, a purpose. And I want you to listen as Jesus describes that purpose straight from this passage. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Our greater works serve the same purpose that Jesus' work served. And that's why he'll give us whatever we ask for in his name. It's so easy to take that little phrase for granted. I think in Jesus' name, and what it means to pray in Jesus' name, is one of the more widely misunderstood aspects of the Christian faith. It seems like we treat in Jesus' name like a magical incantation, where we say whatever we want and then say abracadabra at the end of it. Hocus pocus, presto. But our Christianese form of that is to say in Jesus' name. Ask whatever you want, pray whatever you want, pray it your own way, and then say in Jesus' name. Then, if you believe enough, if you have enough faith, if you've used the right words, if you've prayed it enough times, if the timing is right, and whatever else, presto, you get what you want. (laughs) Friends, I pray that you're able to hear me. That is not Christian prayer at all. That's not what Christian praying is. And for that matter, it doesn't work. (laughs) And people get frustrated because it doesn't work. But it doesn't work because it's not the design. That's not Christian praying. Asking in Jesus' name, and let me make sure I don't forget to say this because I know I've got it in my notes, but Saying that phrase in Jesus' name is not even necessary to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I watched Billy Graham's funeral this week. Well, when they, when they had him lie in honor in our capital, nation's capital. And I was thrilled to death to hear in Jesus' name at the end of all those prayers. Uh, it, it tickled me because I, I like the fact that, his, that, that, that there are those who are, who are not ashamed of the name of Christ. And, and as much as I was thrilled by that, those prayers would have all been valid if they had not added that little phrase at the end. So as much as I love it, I'm also going to recognize that it's not necessary. And I know this for a fact as well, that there are a lot of prayers that are prayed, and then that little tagline is put on at the end, but the full content of the prayer had nothing to do with in Jesus' name. And here's why. That in Jesus' name means that you, to the best of your ability, are letting your prayer life be guided by at least three truths. First, you're able to pray with expectancy because of what Jesus has done for you. That you're acknowledging by praying in Jesus' name that the only that the only basis that you have to bring prayers before God is Jesus and what he's done for you. That if it were not for Christ and all he did for us on the cross, we would have no basis, no merit whatsoever to bring our petitions before God. When I pray in Jesus' name, I'm acknowledging that there is no merit in Brian that would warrant the God of the universe listening to anything I have to say. It's in Jesus' name. I come because of what Jesus did for me. I come with with the assurance that it's his blood that covers me. And when God looks at me now, he sees me in Christ, as Christ. And that gives me boldness to come before the throne. So it's because of what Jesus has done that I'm able to pray. But praying in Jesus' name also means that I'm asking in the content of that prayer something that is in line with Jesus' character. That I'm not simply asking out of my own selfishness or my own personal ambition. But instead, I'm asking in line with Jesus' character. James talks about this, that we pray and we don't receive because we ask with wrong motives. (laughs) 
We ask for things, we ask amiss. We ask for things that are not lined up with his character. We ask things that are lined up with my character. Like, can I have a new Cadillac? I don't want to manage my money right. I don't want to work for it. I just want it. And I know, somebody told me that some, some car, we're driving by, somebody pointed out to me, it's like, that car costs this much money. And I'm like, oh my goodness. They don't even live in it. <laughs> it's okay. If you've got enough money to buy a car like that, I'm thrilled for you. But understand what I'm saying, that if you're just wanting to pile up excess on yourself and you tag in Jesus' name at the end of it, no. That's not an in Jesus' name prayer. If you're, just, if you're just like, hey, I want this, would you, would you God, our spare tire prayer, prayer you, know, you know what spare tire praying is, don't you? I know I haven't talked to you in a long time, Lord, but I've really messed things up, would you please? It's like he's the wrecker service. And you come to him with wrecker service prayers and then tag in Jesus' name at the end of it. You know, not every prayer you pray is in Jesus' name just because you put that tag at the end. It needs to be prayers that line up with his character, not based out of your own selfishness or personal ambition, but things that are in line with his desires and not yours. And hear me, that is a hard thing to discern about yourself. Isn't it? To know your own motives. It's hard to discern that sometimes, and it may take you a lifetime of trying to figure out what that is. You know, that's one of the things when I talk about prayer, one of the things I always tell you is, if you want to learn how to pray, get around somebody that already knows how to pray well. Because you'll learn a ton from being with them and listening to how they pray. And, and, and it's because it's, it's hard to distinguish between your wants and desires and what his are. So it means that you're praying because, in Jesus' name, means that you're praying because of what Jesus has done for you. That's the merit that you have to come before the throne of God. It means that to the best of your ability, you are praying in line with Jesus' character. But third, it also means that you're asking for something that's in accord with his will. Something that's in line with the will of the Father. Jesus said all the time, I'm doing what I see my Father doing. He didn't just go around acting willy-nilly. He was intentional. He saw the Father at work, and that's what he did. He wanted to pray in line with the Father's will. So, so there is a seeking of the will of God, and then there's a praying of the will of God. You can't just assume that you know what God's will is on many situations. You read the Bible and let the Scripture teach you what it can about what God's will looks like. And then in those moments when there's not clarity, you come before God and you say, Lord, I need direction here about what your will is for this situation and ask the Lord to give you some inspiration and guidance. And then you pray in accord with what his desires are. You say, that's a whole lot more work, Brian. It would be a whole lot easier if I just told him what I wanted. <laughs> You're right. But it also won't work. Because there is nothing in this Bible that tells you that you can ask for something and put the tagline on the end of it and you get it. Can you imagine how messed up the world would be if God said yes to everybody. I mean, some of y'all wouldn't even be here today. And I mean, not here, you'd be in heaven or, or worse. Because somebody's got mad at you over the years and they've said, Lord, just kill them. Break their teeth. Kill their dogs, kill their cats. Wipe their memory from their mother's mind. I mean, kill them. You know what I'm saying? Aren't you thankful that God doesn't answer every prayer? Facebook has given me the ability to keep track of some people that I knew in high school. And there are a couple of, I'm sure they're godly women. I hope they are. 
a couple of women that I just was so prayerful. I said, Lord, please let me be with them. I'm just telling you, I thank God for unanswered prayers. I could come with illustration upon illustration. Let me, let me, let me say this definitively, friends. You do not want your will to be done. It will mess you up and mess everything up around you. You need to be thankful before a holy God that he's giving you his will. His will. Lord, I want your will to be done. May your will be done. I want to know what your will is. And then I want to, I want to partner with you and pray for that to come to pass in this world. I want your kingdom to come. Show me what your kingdom is, and I want to partner with you and intercede that that comes to pass on this earth in an ever-increasing manner. Jesus' name is like a filter on your prayer life. That should cause you to question, does this honor him? Does this promote his kingdom? Does this make him more famous? Will it enable me or others to live more effectively for his glory? And is it in harmony with his character and his will? <laughs> I just messed up the content of some of y'all's prayers. You're just like, what am I going to say now? Well, read the Lord's Prayer and, you know, say in Jesus' name at the end of it. Really, I, I pray that you can't hear this. I don't mean to make light of this whatsoever. I've encouraged, I've encouraged you guys to, to come and hang out on Tuesday evenings when we meet to pray. And I know everybody's not available and free. But, and you might not want to stay and pray for as long as we stay and pray. But, but getting around people who know how to pray will teach you how to pray. The disciples looked at Jesus and said, teach us how to pray, when they looked at his prayer life. And he did. And it wasn't just a rote Lord's Prayer. There was content to it beyond that. Anyhow, based on these verses, how does a greater works lifestyle happen for us? Based on these verses, how does a greater works lifestyle happen? Because maybe you don't feel like you're experiencing it. And I get that. There are times where I feel like I'm not experiencing it either. That's why I said that, that, that this passage is an invitation to experience a supernatural lifestyle more than you probably already are. I don't want to make the assumption for everybody else, but I know I feel this way from time to time. So if you want to experience a greater works lifestyle, three quick things. Let's acknowledge that the Christian life is supernatural. It is supernatural. From our conversion to the Spirit's work and bringing us to maturity all the way until we're brought home, it's supernatural that God, that the, the God of the universe, He who created everything, is intimately involved with the details of our life. And He came to me when I was 16 years old in a small church in, in Alcoa, Tennessee, and he, he drew my heart to himself. He took hold of me, and he's held on to me ever since, and he will take me all the way home, and there is nothing about that that isn't supernatural. He's transformed me into a new person. It's a supernatural thing. And we need the Spirit's power in order to do anything and everything that we're asked to do in the Christian life. There is nothing about the Christian life that is possible without the Spirit of God empowering us beyond our own power. Because there's nothing that the Lord requires of us that he doesn't supply spirit power for us to accomplish. And I'm grateful, but we need to acknowledge it. This isn't because I'm awesome, it's because he is. If I do anything for God's glory in this life, it's because there's a spirit within me that is empowering me and giving me the grace that I need to do it. And the Spirit's power is ours because of Jesus and all he's done for us. We didn't earn it. He earned it. We receive it by believing in all that he did for us, not by the works that we might do to try and gain it for ourselves. And that's really, really good news, and it should inspire worship in all of us because it's a free gift. 
Now, many people discount the supernatural altogether, and I get that. There were times when, when I discounted the supernatural. But when you discount the presence and the activity of the supernatural in the Christian life, I think that it robs you of experiencing the fullness of what Jesus died for you to have. And so we need to acknowledge that, yes, we can give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, but if we're really going to give it in Jesus' name, it's going to require the Spirit of God's power at work within us. And we can also pray for the sick that they might recover. And if that is to ever happen in our life, it's going to happen because the Spirit of God's power is at work within us. So first, let's acknowledge that the Christian life is supernatural. But let's also acknowledge that the greater works are for God's glory. We extend Jesus' ministry in this earth, hear me again, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's the purpose of the greater works. It's all about God's glory. And if we see miracles or do other good works, it's all about him and his fame, that God may be glorified. As we do acts of service, we do them so that God may be glorified by the acts that we do. If we teach, preach, share the gospel with anyone, we do it so that God will receive ever-increasing glory in this earth. If we pray for the sick, asking that they might recover, we do so so that God may gain glory through what he does there. As we pray for other types of miracles, the underlying motivation has always got to be not that we just want to see something cool happen or not that we want to see uh, if we want somebody's path to get a little bit easier for them or we want, want something to happen so that it fits more into our agenda. We ask that these things happen so that God might be glorified in the Son so that he might be glorified. I understand that many people, quite blindly, are motivated by selfish ambition, by greed, and even what I would call a humanistic compassion, where the end result is really just to help someone. I'm for helping someone, but the greatest need in somebody's life is not a hungry belly. It's a soul that's been deprived of its relationship with the Lord. And you can go to heaven hungry and go to hell with a full belly. You don't don't ignore anything. You, 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 You meet those needs where you can. But there's a greater need. And the greater need is that God may be glorified in anyone by receiving his son as their savior. So I understand that people are motivated, humanistic compassion even. And in doing so, they, they, they do what they do so that somebody else might get the praise or that the praise might be shared between you know, this person and God or whatever. I know that a pure motive is really hard to come by, but as best as we can, I would say that our declaration today needs to be that we want to have no motive as high as our desire to see God have ever-increasing glory in this earth. And that we live not to just increase our fame, we live to increase his fame. We live not just so that our kingdom or our empire will come, but so that his kingdom will come. Our life here on this earth is not to build up our place It's to increase glory in his space. We must all do this because if God's glory is not first and foremost in your heart, I think that it's very unlikely that you're going to ever experience a greater works lifestyle. Finally, let's acknowledge that we come before the Lord in Jesus' name because of what he did for us. Let's acknowledge that the greater works have to be about God's glory. And finally, let's acknowledge that no greater works happen without prayer in Jesus' name. And this, again, as I've already said, is not mindless praying in Jesus' name as a tag at the end of whatever you want to ask for. It's intentional praying. 
It's praying that comes as a result of studying and understanding the Word of God as it has revealed much of God's will to us. It's praying that comes after we've listened to the Spirit of God as He speaks to His sheep as the Good Shepherd does and reveals His will to us toward any given situation. It's the kind of praying that Jesus would do if He were here in the flesh right now where He would seek the Lord and then pray. I understand that many people will never experience the greater works life because they never pray. And you simply won't if you don't pray. I understand that people don't experience the greater works life because they pray selfishly. They've never been able to discern past their own poor motives. And I understand that they pray with no regard to seeking God's purposes first. I understand why so many people might not experience a greater works life, but make up our minds today that that will not be us, that we will be a people who will seek God and his will and line up with that in our prayers. We'll pray in an effort to be a partner with God in what he's doing in this earth, not attempting to use God as the the bankroll for our ambitions, but rather to be a partner with him in his purposes. And that'll be the content of our praying. Friend, I believe it's a cure for a troubled heart. I believe it's a cure for a troubled heart because it's letting you know that Jesus went ahead, sent something back that's even better, and now we can do and experience everything that Jesus did until he brings us home to be with himself. It's possible for every last one of us who are in him. I just wonder today if you have discounted the greater works, the works that he did in the greater works, if you just discounted them, and you don't live even thinking about them, you're just trudging along, you know, in your own strength and not even giving a second thought to the need and the necessity of the supernatural in the world that you're living in. When's the last time you stopped long enough to listen? I've told you one of the real secrets to prayer is just to participate We listen to the Spirit of God and get in line with what he's sharing with us. We read the Word and get in line with the truth of it. Pray those things. And and I wonder if if just in the busyness of life, you've just not paid attention. We went through last summer and taught on the spiritual gifts. We, We spent a summer doing it. And if I said it once, I'd said it probably 50 times. One of the real keys to breakthrough in the spiritual gifts is simply paying attention. And so I wonder, would you be interested in extending God's fame in your world? Would you be interested in, in, in experiencing the power of God so that he might re- receive ever-increasing glory wherever you go, that you might see the works that he did happening around your own life just like they happened in his? I, I pray that you would be interested. If you would do so, why don't you just... Even today, take a moment and pray and ask God to give you good insight into that thing that's concerning you and say, Lord, what's your will? I want to line up with it so that I can say a prayer that's really in Jesus' name and see the power of God move on that thing. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, I do feel like there's some conviction in here today over what has been some kind of mindless, selfish praying that hasn't really been focused on you or your desire or your your purposes, that we've asked you to show up in power for our own ends and our own purposes. And we just want to repent of that. And and in its place today, would would you begin revealing your purposes to us? We, we make this confession that Jesus made. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And we just ask that you'd reveal your will. And, and we, we would ask that the power and the presence of God would fall 
on my brothers and sisters right now in these moments and that they would experience the, the kind of work that you would do if you were here in person because, in fact, you are here in person. You are here in person in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that is not only personally with us, but he's in us. You're not afar off. You're close. And I pray that you'd reveal that to them, that they might experience the supernatural power and provision that only comes in you. And Lord, may we be a people that ever increasingly experiences and does the works that you did, and even greater, for the glory of God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's all stand together. I want to encourage our ministry teams to come forward. And I want to ask you today, if there's something going on in your life that you want to have somebody pray and agree with you about, take a few moments and come forward. Let one of these ministry teams uh, minister to you. The, the, the point of what we do when we gather together in prayer in these moments is that we do. We ask the Spirit of God to bring some revelation about what's going on in your life, to work through the gifts, and then release the power of God to accomplish his will for you. And we want to pray to that end for you. If you have anything going on in your life, you want somebody to pray with you, I invite you and encourage you to come. Let me speak a blessing over you as we dismiss today. Lord, as we go from this place today, may you be glorified in the Son. May we go as ambassadors that extend your kingdom by by doing all the works that you did, from compassion to the raising of the dead, may we glorify you in it all for the glory of God in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Come if you want to receive prayer. I pray that y'all have a wonderful remainder of your day.